Welcome to the Dental Board of California quarterly meeting. Today is Friday, February 8th, 2019. I want to ask all of you to please turn off your cell phones or, make, or put them on silent and make sure that they're off the table so that we can avoid any feedback noise. You may notice board members accessing their laptops or other devices during the meeting. Um, they're using these devices solely to ex access the board meeting materials that are in electronic format. This is an official business meeting of the Dental Board of California. The board welcomes public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for public comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item and you wish to speak on that, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. Depending on the number of people who would like to testify on a particular agenda item, a time limit may be imposed. We ask all speakers to please stay on topic and if a time limit is determined to be necessary, keep your comments to within that limit. So with that, I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask the secretary to please call the roll. Good morning, Madam Chairperson. Good morning. <laughs> Okay. Burton. Here. Burton present. Chan present. Chappelle Ingram. Present. Chappelle Ingram present. Lai. Here. Lai present. Laren. Here. Laren present. Lay. Yeah. Lay present. Mackenzie. Absent. Mackenzie absent. Medina. Absent. Medina absent. Morrow. Present. Morrow present. Alagi. Alagi present. Pacheco. Here. Pacheco present. Stewart. Here. Stewart present. Witcher. Here. Witcher present. You. Here. You present. We have a quorum. Okay, the first item on today's agenda is the executive officer report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to be collecting the closed session binders after you give your report. So that allows board members the opportunity to take a look at their packet in the event that they need to. So good morning, everybody. My name is Karen Fisher, and I'm the Executive Officer of the Dental Board of California. I'm going to start off my report by indicating that we've started a new year, 2019, and as such, we have new officers of the board. When we have a switchover or transition between officers, I, I meet with the board president and we set up a weekly check-in so that we can make sure that at least weekly we're checking in and talking about issues that are com coming up. Of course, we may speak more often than weekly should uh, the business uh, needed to be attended to. So I did establish a weekly check-in with our new board president, Ms. Burton. I sent out a request for board members to send in their preferences for committee assignments, and together Ms. Burton and I essentially established the committees for 2019. Um, what I wanted to share with you at this point is that after this board meeting, it is our intention to contact the committee chairs to talk about issues they feel they may want to discuss in their committees. We will um, be asking, though, that you consider our staff resources this year as we are in Sunset Review and will be required to respond to the legislature uh, for at least the first uh, six months of the year. So we'd ask you to take that in consideration as you're developing perhaps agenda, agenda items that you would like to see on committees. Uh, there was a... Uh, uh, budget meeting that that we typically have staff has with our DCA budget office <coughs> and we go over the new governor's budget that essentially will take place starting July 1st 
as such, the board's appropriation has been increased, and in the 2019-2020 fiscal year, we will have the authority to spend just under um, $15 million for the dentists, and the uh, appropriation for the dental assisting fund is about $2.5 million. Um, I'm happy to report that we went elect electronic voting on discipline, and Congratulations. This is our first step in trying to go green. And for the most part, everybody was able to walk through the process successfully. Um, I think that it's going to be a wonderful way to do this, and I hope you all will agree. It's, it'll be very convenient. Uh, the trial run is over, and you do have discipline that's due next week. So in the event that you have any difficulty moving forward with receiving the discipline and being able to essentially log in your vote, please call the discipline coordinators and they will walk you through the process. Uh, when they submitted or when they sent out the instructions, they said, please don't skip anything. And so it's funny how if people had trouble, they went back and said, oh, I did skip that part. And so they were able to sort of uh, self-correct. So I'm very pleased. I hope you are too. And uh, I hope this is the beginning of uh, the board's attempt to try to go green. Uh, we are going to try to work toward that even with our board meeting material. And I know that we give five pounds, according to Dr. Stewart, the binders are five pounds. But I asked him about how he scores his golf game. And um, <clears throat> Because I thought five pounds was a little extreme. Um, and then I said, do you know how, how much a bucket of balls weighs? And so we had that discussion. Um, he revised it, not quite five pounds, but maybe three pounds. Uh, but we're going to try to work toward getting board members to rely perhaps more on electronic devices like iPads or their computers. When you come to meetings, uh, I myself, it's going to be difficult because I'm old school. I like to write all over paper and things like that. But we would like to s try to advance the board to actually going green and not having to print these, this material in the future. Um, I also participated, and as did uh, our assistant executive officer, Sarah Wallace. We are in the process of putting together the diversion contract. As you know, the board participates uh, in a diversion program for our licensees who have drug and alcohol problems. And Maximus is a, currently our vendor for that, but that contract will expire at the end of the year. So the diversion program managers from eight other boards are gathering to put together the request for proposal that will be sent out to solicit uh, other interested organizations in essentially bidding on the contract moving forward. So that is still in process. Our staff, our enforcement staff, had a meet and greet with our new uh, Attorney General Liaison, Daniel McGee. He came to the office. We were able to video conference him in with our Orange office, and they had an opportunity to meet Daniel. Uh, we're looking forward to, he's very enthusiastic, as you met him at our last meeting, and we're looking forward to working with him. Sarah and I also met with Senate and Assembly Business and Profession Committee staff. Who are going to be uh, we're, who we will be working with closely on our sunset review process, and um, we had a meeting with Sarah Huckle and separately with Robert Sumner, and uh, just talked about our sunset review report and tried to identify any hot hot button issues. Uh, they had nothing to necessarily report to us or share with us. They are in the process of putting together the report. I believe I, sub I sent board members all the memo that came from the legislature that outlines how the process is going to proceed. So our hearing date is March 5th. For those stakeholders in the audience, you will have an opportunity to make comments at the legislative uh, hearing if you desire to do so. I would recommend you contact Robert Sumner at the assembly and let him know that you do plan to testify. Um, Ms. Burton and Dr. Morrow, Sarah, and I met with Sonia Logman, who at the time was our representative at agency. She requested the meeting so that she could identify 
uh, certain issues to essentially put together her snapshot of what the board does in order to hand it off to the incoming administration. We felt that the meeting was productive. She wanted to know all the key issues that might be discussed during Sunset Review, so we had an opportunity to share with her some of the issues that we've outlined in our Sunset Review report. Uh, she was provo promoted to a new position under the new governor, so we will no longer be working closely with Sonia Logman. There was a teleconference that was held between Dr. Morrow and Gail Mathy and myself uh, relating to the ADEA Compendium of Con of clinical competency assessment. Dr. Lazarchuk is here representing Dr. Fredrickson today and in a, in a little bit he's going to be giving a presentation uh, on this, um, the compendium they're calling it. Uh, it's being developed as a valid and reliable assessment of psychomotor skills as well as relevant patient knowledge, skills and ability. Essentially uh, they're using uh, the California portfolio as a launching point to have this discussion to go nationally. Um, as I mentioned at the last meeting, I had been invited to attend the CDA Government Affairs Council, and Sarah Wallace and I did so. Uh, we had we had a blast. I had a blast. It was. Um, it was a lot of fun to, to go and just update the Government Affairs Council at CDA on our activities. They were very enthusiastic and offered assistance in a lot of different areas. And so it went very well. I hope that's something that we can continue to do on a regular basis. It was, um, it was great. I uh, wanted to give you an update on AB 1753. <coughs> 1753 was the requirement for special printers to be used to print out prescription <coughs> forms. And um, the department has been really watching this uh, and has been interested to see uh, the impact it has had on our licensees. Now, interestingly enough, the board has not been getting a lot of telephone calls relating to this, but apparently the associations have been getting a lot of calls relating to this. And ultimately, uh, Gary Cooper with Cal Amos and Gail have, have shared with us some of the questions. Now, just as a reminder, this isn't our bill. This was a pharmacy bill. And um, we did put together an email blast that went out to our licensees to explain uh, what was going to be happening. And there is information also on the board's website. Now, the pharmacy board had the... the, uh, the the enforcement <coughs> committee of the pharmacy board had made an advisement, essentially, that, that suggested pharmacists have a little leeway for at least six months until people could get their new prescription forms. But um, apparently there was still a lot of confusion and concern, so AB 149 was introduced right after session opened up this year, and it's hopefully going to be pushing back the actual implementation date in order for licensees to comply with this requirement. Um, so we'll be following that and we'll give an update in our legislative section. Um, as the director had mentioned, and I believe President Burton had mentioned, there was a governor's uh, budget briefing that the DCA director gave, so that was by teleconference, and they went over the uh, 18 positions that boards and bureaus will be financially supporting through pro rata. There are eight three-year limited term positions that are going to the legal department to establish a regulatory unit. And there are seven two-year limited term positions to address the increased workload and enhanced audit requirements uh, in the business services or budget area. And there are additionally three positions that will be going to human resources to address their recruitment and uh, return to work workload. Uh, the pro rata increase will be a little under $3 million, but that will be divided among all the boards and bureaus, uh, not specifically just to the dental board. Sarah Wallace also had indicated that we will be receiving, should the governor pass our budget, uh, we will be... Uh, receiving additional positions too. Um, we're very pleased with that. Uh, we, the 
staff did submit the board's omnibus language by the January 18th deadline, so that's in the hopper to, to go into the omnibus bill in the future. Um, I was asked to participate in a survey for the executive officer's salary study that's being done, and Director Grafilo had indicated yesterday that at the upcoming meeting in February, he intends to at least give us an update on where, what that study is showing. Um, let's see. Want to let the board, board members know that our next meeting is in May, and it's on a Wednesday and Thursday. If you'll recall, we started doing that a number of years ago so that members who were interested in attending the CDA conference that will also be held in Anaheim at that time have the ability to attend that conference on Friday. Uh, Dean Grafilo had mentioned also this is a mandatory year for completing our two-hour sexual <clears throat> harassment prevention training. We have not yet received the link, so when we get that link, we'll go ahead and send that out, and we'll be following up with members just to make sure you complete that training before the end of the year. Um, also want to remind you that if you haven't yet filed your Form 700, that is due by April 1st. They've gone to a net file, an electronic filing, which makes it a lot easier. So uh, just as a reminder, there are stiff penalties if you don't file in time. And we have no control over that. That's actually monitored by the Fair Political Practices Commission. So please remember to fill out that Form 700. Um, and lastly, I'm going to be giving our uh, staffing report. Essentially, um, we have one vacancy in what we call our executive office, and that's because Jerry uh, Westerfeld retired. So we are recruiting to fill behind her. Um, we also, the um, administration unit now, which we're calling budgets, ledge reg, personnel, uh, we were able to hire a manager for that unit. And the manager actually is um, somebody that we took from the DCA budget office. So he's got a lot of experience in budgets. He's very familiar with our program. Uh, we're welcoming him, and we hope that he will be coming to a, a meeting in the future. Our licensing and examination unit uh, is actually down four positions at this point. People have left for promotions. And so we're in the process of recruiting and filling those positions. Uh, while the staff has been able to keep up with the workload, it, we're hoping to fill those positions quickly because spring tends to be our high volume time for applications for licenses. So we're hoping to fill those positions as quickly as we can. Uh, the dental assisting program, there's one vacancy and one person on um, extended leave. And um, I'm just looking quickly here. So our discipline coordination unit is completely full. We have one vacancy in the investigative analysis unit. We're recruiting for that and filling that as quickly as we can. Our Sacramento field office is completely full. And we have two vacancies in our orange office uh, since we just recently had somebody who is, uh, took a job with um, insurance, I believe. Carlos is going, yes, insurance. And uh, Russ Predmore, who had been a longtime employee of the dental board, retired. So we're recruiting for a supervisor's position in that. And last but not, not least, um, I have to sadly say that our beloved Spencer Walker is, this is his last meeting. And um, he has taken a position with the treasurer's office. He was recruited by the new treasurer. And of course, they scooped him up. So we have been contacted by the department indicating that they understand we have very complex issues. And they're looking to see who can essentially provide services to us in the interim while they're trying to figure out uh, how this is all going to work out. So I've been assured by DCA that we should know soon uh, who's going to be taking over for Spencer. Spencer will be with us, and I'm going to work him to the bone uh, until the end of the month. 
You always do. I always do. <laughs> we're we're a good team and I'm we're not going to do the tears this time um, this is a huge loss for us I mean in the short time that he's been back assigned to us we have been cranking things out and he just is a workhorse I mean I I, I honestly don't think there's anybody who compares to him in the legal department so he already knows that I'm I'm a former friend of his and uh, <laughs> And I know where he's going, so um, we're definitely going to keep in touch. But um, if you wouldn't mind joining me in a round of applause for him, wish him luck. So I've already done the traitor thing, the former friend, and tried to make him feel bad enough to stay, but it didn't work. <laughs> I, I thought I was really close, but it didn't work. Um, and I believe that concludes my report. <clears throat> Are there any questions? Thank you. Thank you. So next is item 13, a report from the Dental Hygiene Board of California. How did we get lucky number 13 on the agenda? Good morning, Madam President. Board members and Executive Officer Fisher. I'm Anthony Lum, the Dental Hygiene Board's Executive Officer. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to allow me to report out on our activities in the recent months. And I do want to uh, extend my apologies from my president, Susan Good, as she couldn't attend today's meeting. Some of our activities after our sunset review last year uh, the legislature and the governor agreed for us to change from a committee to a board. So as of January 1st, officially, um, we be I'm proud to report that we have become a board. And we continue to be the only autonomous government body in the nation that oversees the dental hygienists, so we're kind of proud of that aspect. Uh, in preparation for this change, we've been very busy in uh, updating our the Breeze computer system, the website, and all of our documents and correspondence that we <coughs> send out. Another area that we've been very busy with is regulations, just like you all have been. And some of the highlights of our regulations that we've been working on are um, because it's already in law about the retired license, we're creating procedures to enact a retired license status. We've received a number of inquiries from many licensees about this, and so we decided it's time to act on it and provide that uh, avenue for those licensees that want to maintain their license but uh, don't want to continue to um, actively practice. Another one that we're working on is mobile dental clinics for the RDHAP licensure categories. And that's to help enhance their practice and be available to uh, other, other areas um, where they're serving the underserved population. Another request that we received um, was to revise our regulation to create the procedures for us to accept the out-of-state uh, education <coughs> and training for soft tissue curatage, local anesthesia and nitrous oxide and oxygen analgesia. <coughs> Currently, any out-of-state applicant must take a, a course that's um, offered in California, and it's pretty <coughs> expensive. So within the law, we already have a provision that allows us to accept uh, out-of-state education and training. So we're just putting in the procedures to enact that as well. Another regulation like you all are working on is the ITRs, or interim therapeutic restorations. And we're getting closer to the final language. Uh, we had a teleconference meeting last week where we did have some revisions or amendments to the language. And within the law of the Business and Professions Code, if we do amend some of the language uh, that doesn't <coughs> correspond to what the pilot project <coughs> has, we must bring it before the board, you guys. So we will be doing that. We'll present it to you at your main meeting. Um, it was just some slight variations and nothing detrimental to the exact content of the ITRs. Uh, 
We will also be addressing regulations for the new laws created by Assembly Bill 2138, which addresses applicants with uh, criminal convictions on their record. You all have already completed that um, draft language and will be doing so in the near future because of tight timelines. Another area that we've been working hard is our personnel. Uh, in the last few months, I've had three people either retire or leave for promotions. And for our small board, uh, that's actually 30% of my workload or my work staff. So we're going to be working really hard to uh, get those positions filled. I did fill my assistant executive officer position. And I think both her and I will make a pretty good team mo in moving forward to get our program on track. I do want to thank Executive Officer Fisher for her extension of help um, and support during the time while we're having uh, difficulties with staffing uh, and refills. So thank you. Welcome. Another area that we've been have ongoing workload is our dental hygiene educational programs. Over the last year and a half, we've actually had to um, remove the the board's or committee's approval of these educational programs due to deficiencies of the law. So what the what the board had to, or committee I should say, I'm getting used to it, no. uh, what the committee did at that point was to stay the withdrawal to allow the schools time to correct their deficiencies in the interest of the students. Because if the program approval with, was withdrawn, those students uh, wouldn't be able to apply for a license in California because the requirement is that they have to graduate from an approved, um, a committee approved educational program. So we stayed the withdrawal until they corrected their deficiencies. And I'm glad to report that all of the, the four schools that we did withdraw the approvals have now complied and are fully approved going forward. Another area that we have is we're undergoing an occupational analysis this year. Uh, it was just recently started in the last month, and we're doing that for both the registered dental hygienists and registered dental hygienists in alternative practice, and hopefully we'll get the results of that um, towards the end of the year. We're working in conjunction with OPES, as we are mandated to do, so um, they're working diligently to get all of this um, workload completed. And that concludes my report. Do you have any questions for me? Are your um, dental assisting, I'm, I'm sorry, dental hygiene programs all COTA approved? Yes. All of them? Yes. Okay. They are all COTA approved, and the 27 schools are <clears throat> approved by us as well. Yes, Dr. Witcher. Have you given any thought <clears throat> to adopting CODA approval in lieu of your own approval? <clears throat> Actually, all of our schools are accredited by CODA already. So the approval for the board to have is in addition to the, to the CODA accreditation. Yeah, it just it seems that <clears throat> maybe CODA could satisfy the standard and save you a lot of work. They do, with their standards, um, hit a lot of the bullet points that we're looking at. But California law has uh, a few more specifics that the schools need to abide by. Mm -hmm. So in addition to the code of standards. Yeah, that's the same thing we ran into with dental assisting code of approval. Mm. <clears throat> Anything else? Thank you, Todd. OK, thank, thank you. you. And congratulations. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It seems like it's making you really busy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, the next item is the update on portfolio pathway to licensure. Good morning. Tina Valerie, manager of the dental assisting unit. I'll be handling this agenda item. Just to give a little background information, um, in November of 17, board staff, along with Dr. Lay and Dr. Morrow, attended meetings with the six dental schools to discuss the portfolio examination. The goal of these meetings was to identify ways in which the board and staff could assist the schools in their implementation of the examination and increase participation in the pathway to licensure. 
From these meetings, four short-term goals were identified, and board staff has been working on completing them. The first three goals were completed and presented at the board meeting in February of 2018, and they were to, one, clarify patient criteria regarding each competency examination, two, research the reciprocity requirements in other states, and three, to inform the public and interested parties about the portfolio pathway through the board's website. The fourth goal, which was to digitize the portfolio rubrics and grade sheets, was still being worked on at that time. Since our November meeting, board staff has continued to work on this project. In December, the digital forms were sent to each of the dental schools. The digital forms were also uploaded to the department's cloud server for the schools to download and use. A test was conducted with UOP to ensure that the cloud server was working as intended and the testing was a success. Since board staff has completed all of the short-term goals, they are now going to be planning additional out outreach visits to the dental schools. The goal is to offer informational workshops to the dental students so that they are aware of the unique opportunity available to them and to give them a chance to ask any questions that they may have about the process. Board staff is currently working with the schools to finalize dates and we're hoping to conduct these in the near future. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. <coughs> Do you have any idea how many students have applied for the portfolio at this time? I do not have that data at the moment, but I could um, find out and hopefully present it before the end of the day. Okay. See so any public comment? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item, Dr. Lay, is red. Okay, um, so the, as the liaison of um, you know, um, the General Board of California to REB, I do attend the, um, the Dental Examination Review Board uh, on an annual basis. The last um, Dental Examination Review Board meeting was in June of 2018, and the next one will not take place until June 2019. Um, there have been some minor changes in the RAP examination um, regarding the administration and those, um, you know, and scoring. Um, I know he, with us today is Dr. Norman Magnuson, and I, he's the immediate past president of RAP, and um, if it's okay, I would like to invite him to come up to make, give us a brief summary of what's happening to the rep exam in 2019 because he has a lot more information than I do. Um, so I'm Norm thank Magnuson. You for being here. Uh, like you said, immediate past president uh, two weeks ago, so I got that burden off my back. <laughs> so, as, um, so uh, there has not been much changes. I think last time I was here, I made. Uh, presentation on some of the psychometrics that occurred since on the on 2018. Um, it, as you know, the major change we had last year that um, if a candidate takes one uh, procedure, operative procedure, and passes with the three or higher, um, they are exempt from taking a second procedure. Um, our psychometrics actually showed that. Um, 92%, uh, almost 93% passed after their first procedure, um, which, you know, it's, it's kind of a normal number. It's, that's what kind of happens all the time. Of those 93% um, uh, who passed, uh, almost 90% of them decided to go on and take a second procedure, most likely because the state that they were going to go to either required it or the students were just so fearful of only doing one procedure in an exam and be able to get a license, so some of them did that. Um, of those um, uh, uh, ones who uh, decided to go on, about 11 percent took two procedures. And um, on a raw, a raw score, 100 percent of those passed uh, on the raw mm -hmm. score. One candidate failed because 
uh, the candidate asked for two modifications that got rejected, which was uh, the penalty was large enough to drop that score below a passing grade. But the raw score, if they wouldn't have asked for modifications, they would have passed anyway. So um, our psychometrics proved true that if you pass with a three, everybody else um, uh, can do that uh, too. Um, of the uh, 7% or so that didn't pass, um, uh, 13% did not go on to take uh, a second procedure, most likely because of a critical error, um, decay was left, or uh, it was such a, a poorly done prep that they couldn't go on, um, or because their score was so low that they didn't feel like they could do well enough on the second preparation to get an average of a three. Um, so, um, but of those, um, 87% uh, that took two procedures, 57% uh, went on and passed the whole exam, which means their first score was probably very close to that three. And so they didn't have to do that much better on the second procedure. And, and um, of those 30% who failed, their first score was low enough that probably no matter how good they did on the second procedure, they couldn't pass. So that all proved out to be exactly what our psychometric data had shown us for the reason for us doing that. So we're going to continue that on this year. It's not going to change. Um, actually, very few things are going to change in 2019. One thing, Rev put so much effort into changing it. Uh, for 2018, we decided to take a year off and <laughs> rest the staff a little bit because we're working them pretty hard. Um, so uh, as, you, as I told you last time, we changed our endodontic procedure from extracted teeth to, to plastic teeth. One of the things that we found out in that process is that there were a number of candidates who, when they started to prep, especially the molar, they prepped the wrong tooth. And it happened because in the old days when we had natural teeth in there, it was pretty obvious which one was the natural tooth and which one was the plastic tooth. So we didn't have this problem. It wasn't an issue. All of a sudden, now they get in there and they get a little nervous. The tooth that they had to prep last year for an access on a molar was tooth number 30, had quite a few people prep number 31 um, by mistake. So we've decided to make that a critical error. Um, if you're in your office and you prep the wrong tooth, uh, you've made a pretty big blunder. And so a critical error means you can't retake the makeup on that exam. You have to come back at a later date and, and do it over. Uh, so we did have a few like that. We also have provisional acceptance where students um, or candidates, most of them are students because they have to go through their schools to do this. They can send in their operative x-rays to REB. Uh, the examiners can review them before uh, the exam. It's about three or four weeks before the exam they review. And as an examiner, we can either approve that lesion from the radiology point of view or we can uh, reject it. If we approve it, uh, the candidates go to the floor examiners, ask for a couple other steps to, uh, for approval, um, make sure there's a contact there, make sure there's occlusion on uh, the opposing tooth, and if that's all the case, they can proceed on with their procedure right at 8 o'clock when the exam starts. Um, we had a number of candidates who would go through the process, that whole process, and they would accept, get accepted from a floor <coughs> examiner, and then they wouldn't use that patient they would do something else, and we couldn't understand why. So we decided to, to uh, discourage the candidates from doing that, so we added a three-tenths penalty. If you, if you went through that whole process and got a patient approved but didn't use them, it's not fair to the patient. It really confuses the rep staff, makes the exam a lot harder. So hopefully that little, little penalty will stop that process from occurring. But other than that, the exam is going to be the same. Is that fairly clear? Any questions? Yeah. Um, okay. Good morning, Norm. Good morning. Can you tell us what the what the process is to be able to apply to sit for the reps, and given the unique. Um, position of California with the international schools, de la Salle and then as Moldova comes into play, how does, what's, what's the process there? Well, the, the general process is you're a student in a, a, a dental school and then the dean signs off. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're an active student in a school and the dean signs, then uh, you can uh, sit for the exam. But we also have processes where states may um, want to have a dentist take the exam, uh, maybe to find out if they're minimally competent in doing a restoration. So a state board can then ask uh, the REB to uh, have a candidate sit. So in your situation here, if you have somebody who you would like to check that and you want to find out if they fall in the minimal competency, you just contact the REB board and say that this dentist or candidate or student or um, they will still have some of the same um, they have to prove that they've gone through an educational program, but you wouldn't approve anybody to do that if they didn't do it anyway. So, so all you have to do is the board just has to approve it, and we okay. would let somebody sit for the and exam. That, that stands for the uh, international schools that are the educational requirements have been approved by California. Yeah, and I think we probably have already done some of those students. I would think is not not true. Some of these. 300 of them. Yeah. yeah. I think we've already gone through this process. Okay. So the board is the one that signs off? or Yeah. They, signs off? The, the, the foreign school wouldn't, probably wouldn't be, because I think I'd have to look deep into the regulations of REB, but I think if it's not a CODA approved school, then it'd have to go through the state board. Yep. I would, does that sound right? Yes, it is yeah. right. Not been a part of that process since I don't fill those applications out myself. Well, uh, thanks, Dr. Magnuson, for taking the time to come to San Diego. I, I would come here every time that I get a chance to. So, <laughs> it's a lot nicer uh, than Eugene, Oregon yeah, right now. Great town. <laughs> uh, another change that I think that Rev has done that potentially affects us here in California is that is making the perio and the pros section optional uh, for uh, taking the, uh, the Rev exam. And I believe that the Rev exam that we approved uh, through our Office of Professional Examination <laughs> Services included the perio exam. So with that said, uh, applications through the REB process for California would require that the PERIO exam was taken rather than optioned out. Is that correct? That's the next item. Oh, that the is next the next item, agenda I item. So I just want to make sure that we understand that these changes can, uh, can have an effect on states that require those. And a number of students at my school have come <coughs> and asked me, you know, relative to that change. Uh, what has REV done to notify institutions, dental schools, of potential applicants for the REV examination of that change and the need to look into that for the state that they're planning on going to? So this, this occurred, I don't know, either one or two years ago. Um, Perio is an opt-out. Um, prosthodontic section is an opt-in. So, um, and the reason is we had a number of states across the country who did not require any perio at all. They, they, their state board said that they didn't think that was necessary. So in order for us to remain on the competitive side of the industry, um, we decided to make the opt-out in perio. Every state receives each section of the exam. So if a candidate doesn't take perio, um, that your state will not get a report that they passed or failed because they didn't take it. Um, and for most states, that has been satisfactory when the one, for the ones who require PERIO as part of their uh, licensure process. So when they get the report from REB, it says they've taken the PERIO, they passed it or didn't pass it, and they move on. For those states who don't dictate what procedures need to be taken, it becomes more of a challenge. Because if they just take REB, um, then, you know, if you don't take PERIO, then I guess that there's a component there that some people might be able to get a license without doing a PERIO component to it. Most states have or, or are in the process of changing for um, not what okay. exam to accept, but which components of the exam to accept. Okay. So, Again, my, my uh, concern is one of communication to the students at the what, approximately 6,000 uh, dental students that graduate from dental schools in the United States every year. Right. That okay. are, a number of them are taking the REB examination or other exams. 
the importance for them to know the consequences, the long-term, even the short-term consequences of opting out of any portion of your examination. That's right. And, and before we get too deep into this, it is the next agenda right, item. So let's just hold that. Good. Good. Another question. Second question. Second question. <clears throat> Does Reb have any any data regarding the pass rate of first attempts, second attempts, third attempts, and never passed as far as candidates taking the Reb exam? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I now I don't have them with me, of Thank course, you. but. Uh, uh, Sharon Osborne Pop, our psychometrician, definitely has those numbers. Um, right now, the never passed rate is right at um, two to two point five percent. So, um, like I said, I don't have the exact numbers. I can definitely get them for you. It wouldn't take long for Sharon to get those to you. Um, so, and she has the exact numbers. You, you go to a derb meeting. She actually shows those how many first attempts, second, third, fourth attempts, and uh, uh, there's not many that take it three times and higher, but there are a few, and there's not, they typically don't pass. I mean, if they can't do it on their third try, they're not going to make it on their fourth, most likely. Uh, yeah, from the psychometric analysis that Sharon shared at the door, but also I think she was here in the past and shared the same information about a year and a half ago. Yeah, about a year ago she was here. Yeah, about yeah. a year ago. And it was about 2.5% that will never pass. And actually the number has gotten better over the last probably 10 years, whereas 10 years ago, if I remember right, um, uh, for me to remember all these numbers, uh, it's about 3% 10 years ago. Now it's down to between 2 and 2.5. So. Um, we don't, we're not quite sure why, but we would think that hopefully that the dental schools are getting better and preparing uh, their students better and, and choosing better uh, candidates for their uh, classes and stuff like that. Thank you. Uh, can you take the, is it unlimited the time for you to take the red? Well, Dr. Laren, could you speak into your mic, please? Good morning. Good morning. Is, is, is there an unlimited amount of times you can take the red? Well, so if you, if you fail the exam three times, so the way exams do it, and I think most exams are this way. I can't speak for the other ones, but I'm pretty sure up to, you know, my knowledge kind of tells me. If you take an exam today and you fail any component of that exam, you can retake it. Now, REB has an automatic retake on certain sections. So if you fail your perio, you can take it in the same weekend or the exam you're at. If you fail endo or prosthodontics without a critical error, all these are without critical errors. If you have a critical error, you're done for that weekend. But if you fail because of score, you can retake. Operative is not so because it's more complicated. So if they took endo and they failed it, they retook endo and they failed it. That means after they've had two attempts and they have failed it. They have one more time that year to take it. If they take endo again and fail it, then they have to go through remediation, and that remediation has to be documented at the school with instructors. Uh, there's uh, required hours that you have to take, so many procedures you have to do before you can retake that exam again. And if you do that, you can go back and retake the exam with the dean's approval or the state's approval, and then you go through the same process over. Well, when that happens, three, two, two or three times, the candidates are just done. They're just, I mean, they realize, everybody realizes you can't pass this exam. So are there candidates out there who may have t tried it three or four times? Yes, there probably are persistent people out there who love to get a failing grade every time they take it. Um, but that doesn't happen very often. We're a very small percentage. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. You want me to sit back or you want me to answer some more of these questions that Dr. Morrow had on the next part? <laughs> Make yourself comfortable where you are. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll wait. I'll wait. And that concludes your report? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. The next agenda item is. Um,
discussion and possible action regarding successful completion of prosthodontics section of REB. I'll take this one. I'm Karen Fisher, Executive Officer of the Dental Board. <coughs> so as has been discussed, there have been a number of changes uh, to the REB most recently in the last couple of years. And uh, the REB came into existence for the Dental Board as a pathway to licensure in approximately 2006. And at the time, it consisted of four subject matter areas such as operative, endodontic, perio, and a comprehensive treatment planning. So there were four at the time. Uh, REB students were uh, recently, in 2018, allowed to opt in or out of taking certain sections, as Dr. Magnuson has indicated. Um, the perio and the prosthodontic sections were changed to become essentially electives. REB provides the students with a score report after completion and grading of the test. And in the past, there's been a total score of either a pass or a fail. Um, since the new format changes now, there is no total pass score. There, each section is scored. Uh, due to the fact that the required section of the REB examination are not currently defined in our statute or regulations, uh, staff will be using only the scores for the three core sections of the exam as defined by REB. And right now that's operative, endo, and CTP. So this is just, this is just sort of a, an update, if you will. Uh, the question came up because somebody took the elective of prosthodontics and didn't pass. So does that mean that they failed REB? And the answer based on how we currently have the REB exam set up is no, because that, that's an, that's, that section is optional. So this was more of an informational item while at the same time letting the board know the REB, we have not defined the competencies of the REB exam. In comparison, we have defined the competencies of the portfolio exam. So somehow, I think in the future, the board will need to be discussing how you want to equalize those examinations. <coughs> Now, we were putting things off until the occupational analysis was done on the dental profession. That's been completed. So uh, we're in the process of having the REB exam essentially evaluated. And what the REB exam is being evaluated for is whether it's in compliance with our state requirements, 139. But we're not looking at specific competencies because we don't have that mentioned in statute or regulation. So at this point, it's just an update about how staff will be moving forward and that if somebody has taken essentially any of the elective processes that have failed, we won't be considering that failing the REB. Are there any questions about that? So I think it's really important for us to be discussing and making the decision because in the future when CDCA examination comes into play, I think it's important for the candidates to know, you know, what we are looking at in our decision of granting a license. Um, because CDCA also has a pros section. Um, so I, you know, and I, you know, talking to the students about portfolio, um, I know this is not, um, it's under 14 examinations, but it's not part of this, but I just want to bring it up now if it's okay. Um, like you said, portfolio has six clinical areas of competency that we are measuring. Um, REP has four, and CDCA, I'm assuming, will be looking at four. Um, I you know four um, areas, just like REP. Um, so talking to the students about portfolio, uh, just very recently, what I found out that I thought was interesting was that um, this group of students that I talked to did not really mention portability as the top reason for not doing portfolio anymore. It was actually the areas of competency. 
because for the six areas of clinical competencies that they have to go through with portfolio, they have to have six patients. Whereas for RAP and CDCA, they only have to look for two. So after doing the competency exams for the school, which includes six clinical areas, now they have to come up with six more patients to meet the portfolio criteria. And that's very hard to come by. You know, and that's why I think RAP CDCA with the with this portability is a lot more attractive because now they just have to find two more patients instead of having to find six more patients. Um, and also the long term of portfolio is a two year process. It's very long, and they say they have their life is too busy to be, you know, keeping track of all of the you know exams and that they have to do. Whereas with CDCA and RAP, it's just it's a two day exam much easier, much less stressful in there. And at this point, I'm just going to interrupt you because I only brought it up as a comparison. Yeah. Um, I I guess what I'm asking is for uh, a board member, if you feel that this is an issue that needs further discussion, to bring it up when when we talk about future agenda items. Ask that this be put on a future agenda item for discussion. And that would be whether or not we need to be looking at the regional examination and defining what competencies need to be tested for the regional examinations. Dr. Witcher. Won't that question be partially answered by one, what comes out of the REP Section 139 review? No. They're going to be doing a linkage study to see whether or not their exam is psychometrically sec- sound. There is no, um, and, and their, uh, no, it, I'm sorry, ADEX was in the process of just doing their occupational analysis. Oh, okay. So uh, ADEX was in the process of doing their occupational analysis to determine essentially, I assume, what competencies they're going to be testing, but we don't, we don't outline in statute what the ADEX competencies are going to be either. Um, are, you're, ADEX ADEX just finished their occupational analysis and we're embarking on the review right now, but it is essentially a linkage study. It wouldn't necessarily go into the competencies. And and we have not defined the competencies in statute. And and we've also contracted with OPS in the next fiscal year to review the REB and the portfolio exam as well, but the question relating to what competencies needs to be addressed is is an important component that wouldn't necessarily come out as a result of those those reports. Is, is does that matter? I mean, if they find the exam is statistically valid and legally defensible, then well, I isn't uh, the question moot? Just I mean, I'm just well, we, we, we can at least rest assured that the Reb examination is legally defensible. But the question, as Dr. Magnuson has said, different states have different requirements. California doesn't have specialty licensure. So if somebody essentially knows they're going to be an endodontist and go to a, goes to a state that gives a specialty license, they're going to be taking that section of REB in order to do that. California doesn't have specialty licensure. So at some point, the board will probably need to be discussing whether or not it is important to define what the regional examinations are going to be, or a portfolio, if a portfolio takes off nationally, the competencies will need to be defined in that as well. That that's that's my recommendation, but it would be up to the, the board to determine whether that's necessary. That's but that's for a future uh, future discussion. I agree. I think it's <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's important that we agendize this for future discussion. I do have a question at, right now, though, that I would like to propose to present. Back when the REB examination was originally approved by California, it included four competencies. There's a, to me, there's a logical assumption that that examination as approved, if it changed, then is it still approved? And that, that's a question that I have that I think we need to discuss. Is it still the same examination? No, it isn't. It's missing 25% 
of the examination. It's missing a competency that was included in the original examination, which was approved by the board and by OPES. Do we need to look at that now, again, from a standpoint of is it still approved if it's changed? Can well, I speak on that just a little bit? Let me just respond okay. first. That That's essentially the point of bringing this issue up is that um, it the competencies have never been defined. So right now <laughs> statute talks about accepting the rep, but the board never took the next step since 2006 to define what that means, whether it's whether in regulation the definition occurred or whether in statute the definition occurred. So in essence, I would respond to you, Dr. Morrow, by saying the exam is whatever REB determines the exam to be, and the board has accepted that, regardless of any changes that are made, because the board has not moved forward to define what they would want REB to test. Then that also stands true for the ADEX exam. That's correct. Right. Okay. Yeah, the, the truth of it is is that probably one of the reasons REB took the PERIO out is the other testing agencies don't have that as a, as a requirement either. So I can only speak for the state of Oregon when we were granting licensure to people who would take any <coughs> exam but not all the exams were the same. There were some of them were different. It created a huge problem for us in Oregon. Many states have just gone into now saying what competencies do they want. Uh, they want an operative competency. What does that look like? One or two? I mean, psychometrically, we can show that one is enough, but some states say they want to have two. So, two. Some states have said, yes, we do want the prosthodontic section. Wyoming at one time wanted a gold restoration from REB. They've now changed it to say that they will accept our prosthodontic section. Um, does that make the exam easier or harder? I don't know. I think uh, placing an onlay on number 14 would be a lot harder than prepping three teeth in plastic would be. But um, yes, states now are changing to not which exam to take, but which competencies to take. So to get my license, I had to do a gold foil. <laughs> so did I. I actually enjoyed it. <laughs> it was a challenge. Yeah, I think you know the confusion actually came in when Rep decided to um, to make Perio opt in, opt I mean, yeah, opt out. Opt out. Yeah. It's not and, an option. It's not really optional. It's still com it's still yeah, considered so, part of it. But for those states who don't require it, the students can opt out yeah. of it. So I'm wondering if instead of saying opt in and opt out, could you just leave it alone and let the candidates choose? Well, we figured that if we let the candidates whatever, choose, yeah. more likely, the, Dr. Morrow is right. The confusion is what the students, I mean, what do you tell them? Yeah. Well, we've come to the point now where, if, depending on where you want to go, you have to call your state board and you have to find out, well, I'm sorry, last year a lot of state boards had no clue what they were going to do. This change was just beyond their ability to understand. So sometimes they would say, yeah, you need to have two Two restorations, someone. Yes, you have to take pros. No, you don't. Now states are going back and revisiting their initial licensure requirements, which I think is a good thing. That's your job. That's what you're supposed to do. And so what do you expect out of your out of your candidates who are wanting licensure? What do you want to have to show for minimal competency? Then we as a testing agency are supposed to find the best, uh, highest validity, um, the most value, make sure it's reliable, consistent, to tell you that yes, this candidate is minimally competent or not. That's our job. So in a sense, REB has kind of shaken up the, the dental world in the boards, but it's been for a good thing because people are starting to have to do what they sh we should have been do doing as board members. I didn't do this when I was on my board, and I wish I would have. I wish we would have been down this road. So yes. Maybe thank you. Maybe I'm sorry. I don't know which to say to you guys. <laughs> Any other questions? Any public comment? Just very quickly, uh, what, one reason Perio was made optional, uh, as I recall, maybe I'm correct me on this, is that there were problems with that section. It was difficult to score. It was difficult to make sure it was reliable. I, actually, that's probably may. The hard part with Perio is that it's 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 a fairly high rate of of passing, so 
it doesn't quite have the psychometric review as operative does or endo when you have a little bit higher. Because what happens is problem in perio, you have two, two types of patients. You have somebody who has a lot of calculus that you look at it and falls off. As you as a dentist or a hygienist, you know this. And then you have those patients that you have the same amount of calculus, but it's so tenacious. I mean, you have to use little sticks of dynamite to get it off. Well, that's not quite reliable for both candidates and stuff. But the same happens with operative. I mean, you can have the same restoration to do, but you have two different types of people, one that's very fearful and one that falls asleep before they get the chair back. I mean, that's part of the exam. And it happens the same in the portfolio because when you deal with patients, this is what you have to deal with. Any kind of exam is going to have this complex performance task to it. That's what dentistry is, a complex performance task that's not based on one issue. It's based on a multiple of issues, and we have to find a way to examine for that to find out the competency of our, of our candidates, regardless of which way we do it, whether it's in our type of an exam or in a portfolio type of exam. So that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, the takeaway is that Perio doesn't have a high yield in terms of uh, outcomes. Well, many states feel sections. that they're, <clears throat> since their dentists rarely do root planings, that they shouldn't have to be graded for it. So if you go, some states just feel like since they don't have to perform that, my personal opinion is that I may not have to perform it, but I need to be able to check for it. I have a hygienist that I'm responsible for, so I have to go in and make sure that the calculus has been removed. That's just my personal opinion. I think somebody here has something to say. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Gail Matthew, CDA. So this has been a illuminating discussion for me. Um, and so just to get clarification, because I also thought that 139, when, when we originally moved from this California-based dental examiner exam and we were starting to look at other exams in California, I thought one of the elements of 139 was equivalency. Like if we do this other thing, is it equivalent to the, to the folks that are also taking the California-based exam? And I think I've heard today there is no part in 139 that assures or tries to look for equivalency between examination licensure processes. Is that an accurate statement, what I just said? There is no equivalency evaluation. I don't, I don't know that that's the word we would use. What OPES does is look at REB to do a linkage study. Not being a psychometrician, I don't know if it's saying the same thing as equivalency. But OPES is reviewing any regional exam that we provide in California for to determine whether that particular exam is psychometrically sound and legally defensible within the California standards outlined in 139. So the terminology I can't speak to. Okay. But the key in this is that the board never defined what any regional exam would look like in terms of competencies. Right. And I'm think I'm even asking the question beyond a regional exam, right? We have these various ways that competency is being looked at to to be determined and, right. and you know say yes, you yeah. can get licensure that way. So uh, I think I'm I'm hearing that it's just not addressed is what I think I'm hearing. Thank you. Lisa Okamoto, CDHA. Um, my recollection from the August uh, dental board meeting with the rep discussion, um, my impression was that perio was a required element of the California exam. <clears throat> Excuse me. And discussion at that time uh, asked rep if um, there was going to be some measure of uh, requiring California licentious to opt in and whether there would be some um, records to determine if other students who would later wish to come to California would we know if they had taken the exam. So that's one question. Was that not correct? Is the opt-in for the period not a requirement for California candidates? And then secondly, 
um, with Karen's statement today about uh, the competencies not being in statute, if California students are required to opt in, uh, does it mean anything if the staff does not need to consider whether they passed or failed that perial portion of the test? Well, I, I think that what I said was, um, if yeah, if it's opt in or opt out, it's not considered the core of REB, and therefore staff would not, if they chose to take those sections, it wouldn't be considered failing REB. At one point, uh, as I mentioned, when when what we saw years ago was that. If there were a number of sections, and if you failed any one of them, you failed REB. And we got a scorecard that said failed. But now, um, we're, we won't be getting that. We'll be getting separate scores for each section. And so staff, I believe, will only be looking at the three core sections now. Because we have not defined in the state what any of the sections would be. I see. So um, that that primary is it. My correct understanding that it was part of California's core requirements at one time for our exams, and that if we wish to return to that prior competency, regs or statutes would now be required by the yes. board. That's what you're saying. Yes. Thank you. And remember, perio is an opt out, so it is still considered part of a, the core part of our exam. It's just some states don't require it. So, okay. So, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, I think I think we, you know, there's been a a suggestion we agendize us for a future agenda item, and I think it, it's beyond the discussion we can have here today. Right. And I can bring back a lot more information, and we are ready for the psychometric review from OPIS. That's not a problem, so we're looking forward to that. But, um, yeah, I can bring back any information that you so desire. Just let me know ahead of time so I have it. I've seen Sharon's work. Yeah. <laughs> well, i got a whole packet full right here, so <laughs> make sure I say the right thing. Okay. Thank okay, you thank so you. much. Um, let's take a break now for people who need to check out and I don't know what time it is um, it's 10 20 let's try to get back here in 20 minutes tops are on item 15. 15. Review of dental licensure and permit statistics. <coughs> no. I'm sorry. Presentation. I'm sorry. On dental licensing examination reform. Thank you for your patience, Dr. Lazarczyk. If you'd go ahead and just give a brief um, introduction of yourself. Uh, Yes. Um, good morning, and uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about the California Portfolio Exam and the American Dental Education Association's Compendium of Clinical Competency Assessment. Uh, my name is David Lazarczyk. I'm an Associate Dean at Western University College of Dental Medicine in Pomona. Um, I'm a member of the work group that has developed the compendium. Uh, I'm also the point person. I, I was, uh, as, as a brand new clinic dean in 2011, I was involved in the development of the California portfolio. Uh, and so I'm the point person for the portfolio exam uh, at our college. And um, I'm filling in for uh, Dean Stephen Fredrickson this morning because he's at the CODA meeting uh, in Chicago. <laughs> Now, as I'm sure you know, for years there's been ongoing efforts to update the license process. Um, good examples of this would be licensure by postgraduate training or licensure by the Minnesota OSCE, or the bold and innovative approach that the Dental Board of California took with developing 
the California portfolio exam. Uh, the state and the, and the dental board both deserve great credit for pioneering this effort at change. Um, the amount of interest in updating the licensure process is reflected uh, in recent resolutions by the American Dental Association, the American Dental Educators Association, and the American Student Dental Association, all calling for elimination of the traditional high-stakes single encounter procedure-based patient exam as a primary requirement for initial licensure. The momentum for change generated by the portfolio exam has been maintained by the leadership of the ADA, the ADEA, and the ASDA, uh, including and bolstered by the support of the last four successive ADA presidents. Uh, several reports and white papers have all reiterated the call for the elimination of the patient component of the clinical board exam, and this resulted in the formation of the IDEA work group, of which I'm a part, that developed the compendium of clinical competency assessment as an alternative method for initial licensure. I'd like to reemphasize that the California portfolio exam was a very positive move in the right direction. By addressing many of the shortcomings of the initial of the traditional exam, excuse me, <coughs> the compendium work group looked at the portfolio as an a good a model example um, for good reason. The portfolio integrated the exam into the existing curriculum using calibrated examiners with co careful board oversight. Um, this generated a lot of national interest in whether this would be a successful method for initial licensure model for other states. Uh, unfortunately, there are challenges with the exam that the board is now addressing, some of which Dr. Lee has alluded to already. The biggest challenge is the lack of portability for this exam for initial licensure in other states. Um, Many of the states listed in the document that the dental board staff put together actually require several years of practice uh, before being able to license through the portfolio method. Most of the states that claim to accept the exam for, la um, for licensure actually require three to six years of practice experience, thus restricting mobility for new graduates. For many graduates, mobility in the early years of their careers is very important to finding residency program positions, jobs, or following a significant other out of state. So waiting several years for them to get an out of state license is not really an option. Despite the shortcomings, all of the six California dental deans, and there are now seven dental deans, all of them are highly supportive of the portfolio concept and revising it for better outcomes. The points of agreement are outlined on the slide here. They all see portability as a key attribute for success. Um, they also realize that the numerical requirement that's in there really doesn't align with competency-based dental education models that have been prevalent for the last 15 years and also may not any longer represent changes in disease patterns and demographics. There may be a significant advantage to working collaboratively with the compendium development because if the portfolio and the compendium were one and the same, this could provide a jump start on the portability of initial licensure. Uh, the dental deans will be meeting in April to further discuss this concept. Now that I've highlighted how much support there is to make the portfolio concept successful, uh, let me explain what exactly the compendium is. Noting that the joint ADA, ADEA, and ASDA report released just last fall in the highlighted section there, um, considered the portfolio and the compendium equivalent as one of the three main components for an updated licensure process. So what is the compendium and why consider it as a means of initial licensure? Like the portfolio, it has what we're called fidelity, the patient care component that many licensing boards require. 
It's incorporated into existing competency assessment plans that dental schools are already required to have for accreditation, oftentimes consisting of hundreds of formative and summative assessments. For example, our school has over 400 summative assessments and over 1,000 um, formative assessments in order for a dental student to graduate. Because the compendium clinical competencies overlap the ones, same ones of dental schools, it could be relatively straightforward to implement and it could be tailored to support and be adopted by dental schools across the country supporting nationwide portability. Eliminating the need for tr traditional high stakes board exams that often disrupt, disrupt a significant portion of the senior year curriculum and clinic operations. The compendium is founded on the same key tenets as the California portfolio exam, um, using a thin slice or sample of existing assessment mechanisms that schools already have in place. It can provide a valid and reliable assessment that it, IDEA is now working to verify through psychometric analysis. It could also provide student reporting performance through a centralized database and a standard format that could be assessed by multiple licensing agencies. And most importantly, it assesses ready for readiness for practice, not just an ability to complete technical procedures. The design of the compendium started with the same six discipline areas as used in the California portfolio and added the concept of calibrated faculty and also one of concept of independent performance over time that was borrowed from the entrustable professional activities literature in medical education. An entrustable professional activity is a discrete essential activity or task that all new healthcare graduates must be able to perform without direct supervision upon entering practice and it's backed up by educational literature. As I mentioned, the compendium also incorporates a mobile digital evaluation system that streamlines the process for faculty examiners and centralizes the data automatically. The compendium process has been reviewed with primary collaborating partners such as CDA and the California Dental School Deans and some from other states. This is a schematic of the proposed process, which would, like the California portfolio exam, occur throughout the clinical training years uh, of dental school. It begins in the upper left, where a school would submit their assessment criteria for compendium participation. A compendium, a compendium review service run through IDEA would review the assessment criteria and develop the rubric. Faculty and students would then be calibrated on the rubric and the compendium process. Students could participate in the compendium pro pro process as it's integrated into clinical ed education, just like they do with the California portfolio. Schools would then collect and submit the assessment data, and this can be done on a smartphone or a tablet. Uh, and that information and data is tracked back to the IDEA compendium service where it's verified for completion and then forwarded to the state licensing agencies. Students would then complete other state licensure requirements such as law exams and then automatically be issued a dental license once they graduate from dental school. In summary, um, the foundational concept, concepts of the compendium include competence, which from recent dental education literature Three elements, multiple assessments, over time, with multiple evaluators provides the best strategy for global assessment of student competence in a valid and reliable manner. Another foundational concept, independence, natural progression of learning leads to independently and repeatedly providing care that meets or exceeds, exceeds expectations. And fidelity, as I've mentioned before, students performing patient care, which is addressed in multiple dimensions, beyond just technical proficiency. This is the thin slice or array of areas that's been proposed to be evaluated in the compendium, uh, very similar to that in the current California 
hybrid portfolio exam, but the area of restoration of teeth has been combines assessment of direct and indirect restorations, and the area of replacement of teeth combines assessment of removable, fixed, and implant prosthodontics in order to allow some flexibility to meet patient needs during the assessment process. Here is an example of the draft rubric that we have developed that could serve as a template for any dental school to use as part of the compendium process. There are four main categories, uh, a little difficult to read on the slide, maybe there is a copy of this in the, um, in the board materials for today, but the four categories are preparation for patient care, patient and appointment management, procedure or technical aspects of the visit, and patient care outcomes. These four categories remain fixed and all programs use them. Note that the four categories go beyond technical requirements and measure elements like patient management, record keeping, and interpersonal relationship skills that are essential for successful and ethical dental practice. Under the four categories or the bulleted points, programs could customize the criteria for assessment to mesh with their individual and unique curriculum. Calibrated faculty would then assess the students on two different scales, one being whether or not they met expectations for the procedure for that day, and the second scale being on the level of independent practice that the student demonstrated during the patient encounter, ranging anywhere from needing a lot of hands-on guidance to complete independent practice. These competencies would be assessed not in a single encounter, but over time through multiple assessments that regularly occur in the dental school curriculum with documentation of increasing levels of performance until independent practice was achieved. Once a student was able to repeatedly demonstrate complete independence in performing patient care in the assessed disciplines, they would then fulfill the patient care competency components necessary for licensure. The questions that the task force is currently working on include how thin can that slice or sample of assessments be without compromising the validity and reliability of the exam. We're currently putting together a survey that will go to dental school deans, clinic deans, and academic deans, gauging how well their schools could provide the patient care experiences necessary for repeated demonstration of independent patient care. And also, how, to, how the compendium exam could best be integrated into existing assessment processes. A key question for all involved parties, including dental schools, CDA, and the dental board, is why not link the efforts of revising the California portfolio with the current development of the compendium? We who have worked on this project see it as a model for initial licensure that could be adopted across the country, ensuring licensure portability from state to state, and that large numbers of dental students in California would then want to take the exam. For us right now, the, the next step to keep the, mo the process moving forward is to seek uh, communication and feedback with collaborative partners uh, Dr. Fredersen will be meeting with the CDA Board of Trustees in a few weeks to give them a presentation uh, at our American Dental Educators Association annual meeting in Chicago in March. There will be focus groups there with various schools and also a work group meeting. Uh, we hope to have the academic and clinical dean survey deployed by March or April to get feedback from the dental schools. Uh, and this will be a topic of discussion also at the California dental dean's meeting in April. So that, in a nutshell, is the compendium. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to speak, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Are there questions? Dr. Witcher. 
Yeah, this is this is really interesting, and uh, you know, I think we all recognize there is some need for a revision of the portfolio model as it's currently implemented in California. I mean, it's only to be expected that something that was introduced a number of years ago has now uh, been implemented, and we're now getting feedback on why it works and doesn't work. Uh, that some some changes would be in order, uh, but. You know, getting back to your question about how could portability be improved, uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure. I think the thing that we found, and Dr. Lays, and we've talked about this at other meetings, is the challenge is getting states to recognize something other than a clinical licensure exam, which uh, it just seems to be hard for them to let go of that. And I think the compendium model is going to face that challenge, just like portfolio does. I, you know, I, I think you're, you're right. I, I think it is uh, kind of rolling the boulder uphill. Um, I, I graduated in 1984. Uh, I've taken three clinical board exams. I, I never dreamed that there would be the change that there's been in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, so I, I, I guess I, I think we're taking the optimistic view and trying to push forward with the change. Um, you know, my own personal belief is that um, as there's younger, and no offense to anybody, but as there's as a new generation comes into leadership, I'm hoping that they'll be more open to change. Um, you know, I, I don't know what else to say about it, I, but but I think we're committed to at least trying to to attempt it, and I, I think. The, the compendium at least makes it easier for the schools, and if we can get a lot of the schools on board to accept this as a method, you know, perhaps the, the other state boards will, will move along also. But I, I, I do understand the challenge before us. Okay. David, I, you know, David and I know each other, and we, we live just down the street from each other on the freeway, so uh, we see each other quite often. Uh, Obviously, to a certain extent, you're, uh, I might say, you're preaching to the choir to us from a standpoint of uh, licensure reform, especially initial licensure reform. And as you said, even though the portfolio, the curriculum integrated portfolio exam in California hasn't taken off like a wildfire, it certainly, I think, started and stimulated a, a serious discussion that I think had been avoided for some time and desperately need, needed to be done and needs to continue to be done from a standpoint of, of licensure, dental licensure across the, the, the nation. A uh, couple of questions that I, that I have. I, I kind of got from your, uh, and I've, I've seen most of this presentation previously, as you know. I kind of got the idea that IDEA is, is willing to serve as the third party oversight in this type of a process, which a number of the licensing agencies, state boards require in their examination processes that there's a third party oversight other than the school and the student, uh, but a third party to oversee that. Is that correct? Yeah. That IDEA yeah. is stepping up to the plate and saying, we will be the third party oversight. Yes, they, they are interested in serving that role. And um, as, as you know, they have a lot of experience through running the ADSAS, the big dental school. Um, application service. Um, they have di three different application services that they, they run for dental school. And so, yes, they, they, they are interested in, in stepping up and possibly <coughs> serving as that, um, that agency. You know, in your shot slide that showed the procedure uh, process, uh, the first one was that, I, as I jotted it down, the school submits assessment criteria to IDEA, is this insinuating that each uh, examination is going to be custom designed, so to speak, for each school? Um, there, there is some customization to it. Um, when I showed the, the rubric up there, there are, there are four different categories in that rubric. So the idea is that those four categories would not change. Um, all schools would have to use those four categories. Um, but as you and I know, trying to get schools to completely agree 100% on, on different rubrics is probably impossible. So this gives the schools some uh, latitude to, so the bullet pointed exact criteria that go under those categories could be customized by the school. 
Okay. But the categories <clears throat> always stay the same. And, and as you know, the assessment criteria for the portfolio curriculum, curriculum integrated exam was developed and designed by the schools in California at the time. Yes. Uh, there were some, it wasn't, it, it wasn't always easy to have the representatives from the five schools primarily and then your school later on to agree on that. So, uh, and now some of those assessment criteria, some of those rubrics are part of the stumbling block and the speed bumps that the deans now are identifying as impeding the process uh, as far as the uh, curriculum integrated portfolio exam. Uh, but again, that wasn't identified or developed by the board. Those were developed by the school. Yes. So in essence, they're saying they didn't do a good job you know, at the time. <laughs> so now we're having problems with that. Uh, but <clears throat> I was, I'm assuming then in any way that IDEA at least is going to have some standardization of those assessment criteria, even though each one of the schools will have some input into that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, another one, as far as the restoration of teeth is concerned, obviously the, the portfolio examination identifies both direct and indirect, and you're simply proposing a restoration of teeth. Uh, again, will that include both direct and indirect, or is it a choice, or how? Um, I, I believe it could be a choice. You know, th this is a very um, kind of skeletal framework at, at this point, and, and a proposed design for it. Um, I, I, I think the more important one was the replacement of teeth that kind of puts fixed and removable and implant dentistry together. Um, kind of recognizing that uh, disease patterns have changed with the introduction of, of implants. Um, the number of removable parcels being done is, you know, at, at most schools, I believe, is dramatically uh, dropped, probably in practice also. So it recognizes the possibility of a student doing an implant case for their, uh, for their competency series, um, not, not just, um, you know, a removable or a fixed restoration. You know, with with two organizations, three actually, with the with as the American Student Dental Association, the American Dental Education Association, the American Dental Dental Association, three organizations working on this project altogether, and and as Dr. Witcher uh, stated, and I agree, that one of the problems that we've obviously had with the curriculum integrated portfolio exam is getting the licensing agencies to accept it for licensure. I will say that I have been invited to uh, several states' boards to give presentation to them regarding the California's portfolio exam. And everyone that I visited, after I had explained it to them, they have accepted it. So I think a lot of the uh, resistance maybe is they don't understand. What is or have it been discussed at this point, what is organized dentistry, the ADA, what is educational dentistry, ADEA, and the student association planning to do to market this to the licensing agencies? Because if they don't accept it, then we're up against a locked door. Yeah. Um, I, I wish Dr. Fredrickson was here to, to answer a couple of these questions because I'm, I'm a little lower on, on the totem pole. Um, but I believe they are planning presentations to the um, Dental Examiner's Board and um, the, the Agency for, um, for, for Licensing Boards, but I, I don't really exactly know. I, I know that they've talked about um, the importance of that marketing, but I don't know what the specific <coughs> plans are right at this time. But I can, I can certainly have okay. um, find well, that out. I, I do think that's an important yeah. component of a campaign to accomplish a meaningful uh, change as far as uh, licensure uh, examination and licensure, initial, especially initial licensure is concerned. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much for being here and for giving us you know, um, the information on the uh, compendium. And I think it's, it looks very promising, but I have sort of the same question, you know, as Dr. Morris said. Um, I guess, you know, at this point in time, the conversation is just among the deans and the f educators. At what point in time does IDEA plan 
to reach out to the state boards across the country because that's going to be where um, yeah. you will find success or, or lack of. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know the specific plans on that, but um, I, I can find out and, and get that information to you. <clears throat> Uh, can I just add one more thing? <clears throat> you mentioned that uh, Dr. Fredrickson, the dean at, at your school, was meeting with CDA on February the 23rd. I just want the board to know that uh, I am also meeting with, at, with CDA Board of Trustees uh, on that date, along with uh, Karen, our executive officer, and also a representative from the University of Pacific. Uh, we'll also be meeting with the uh, CDA Board of Trustees, and I believe, and you can correct me if I'm mistaken, but <clears throat> one of the objectives of this meeting is to uh, discuss some of the challenges that we are having with the portfolio curriculum, curricula, curriculum integrated exam, and what can we do moving forward to make some legislative and or regulatory changes to improve the acceptability of it and the desirability for students to be more involved in, in going through that process. Could I just, uh, regarding the question of marketing, and this is not exactly marketing, but, but I think the thought also that if California the state of California were to be involved in this process and put it into place, just like with the California portfolio exam, you know, kind of the eyes of the nation in the dental community are, are on making this exam successful. So I, I think, you know, there is a lot to be said that California being on the cutting edge in many ways, if they could join with the compendium group and make this a really successful exam process, um, that would, could serve it as an example. To, uh, to other states, but I, I do realize it is up to the individual state um, licensing boards. I, d I did have a question, Dr. Lazarczyk. Um, so, ADEA is taking this proposal and moving it. What states are represented on the task force that's essentially going to move this? Do you, do you know that? Uh, yeah, there are about um, eight of us. Um, California, Virginia, um, Indiana. I don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but yeah. perhaps you can send me an email and yeah. let me know because I think that that's hopefully that's a critical component yeah. that and, and the, uh, the work group is a is a um, just kind of a subgroup of the larger task force. <coughs> Um, that idea has put together, and I, I don't know who is on the, that, but um, we can get you that, that information. And of course, idea is you know has nationwide um, right. representation. Any other questions? Uh, I have no doubt that this will be showing up at one of the AADB meetings, which is now on our radar, which we're a member of, and hopefully we'll be sending some people to. I just have one more question, too. When, when Adia is talking about these things, and because you are interacting with people from other states, are, are, they to, are the other states or the other educators tuned into this breaking down barriers to licensure throughout the country? Very much so. Um, probably academic dentists move around quite a bit more than, than, um, than someone who opens a practice somewhere and probably stays there for, sure. for most of their life. Uh, and also, like I said, with the younger graduates, mm -hmm. you know, mobility for them is, is so important. It's, it's a very mobile society for them. So yeah, there's great interest in this, so, which I think is why um, you know, the American Dental Association um, came, came on board with this, because they're hearing from their, their younger members that mobility and licensure portability is a really important um, concept to them. So yeah, I think there's a lot of support for it. I am so grateful that all of our board members meet that uh, criteria of being on the younger side. 
<laughs> and I truly believe that. Forward thinking, ready to change, making movements as necessary. So I'm, I'm pleased to be working for a board that has a very open mind and appears to be at the forefront as most of ca what California does. So um, I, I'm hoping that we'll get our, I, I agree with you, if we can get our California dental schools to get on board with this and, and really promote it and see the advantage to it, that, that'll, I think, be a huge key. Yeah. And if I could say uh, one last thing, I, I think the digital component of this that we've looked at using um, would make the paperwork processing and all that um, so much easier for, for the board. Um, this digital application, you know, basically a faculty member can sit chair side, grade a student on a, a cell phone or a smart, uh, a, um, a tablet, you know, the data automatically goes to a database. It has a dashboard. You, you can look up any student and see where they are in progress, and then that information can be shared with the board. So it, re it really would streamline that whole um, grading process that's rather cum cumbersome with the existing exam. So, just, just a, can, do you have a current, do you have a list of the states that are currently accepting portfolio for initial licensure? I had been asked that question earlier today, and uh, we're, we're going to go back to the list that we had made and verify okay. exactly what that is. Okay. After we produced the list, there was some question about whether the states accepted, whether they'd be accepting California students or whether they were going to be essentially utilizing our program in their state, mm -hmm. and so there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Okay. So at this point, I'm not comfortable okay. with the data that we've put together so far, but we will put that on the list moving forward to see if we can get some more background information. Okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> Anything else? Any public comment? Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Okay, the next item is um, review of dental licensure and permit statistics. <coughs> Hi, Tina Valerie, I'm dental assistant manager. I'm going to be presenting the dental licensure and permit statistics. This memo provides an overview of the dental licensure and permit statistics. It shows the number of licenses that are active, inactive, retired, disabled, canceled, and delinquent. It also shows the number of licenses in the process of being renewed. Staff has provided a breakdown of licenses issued by year and by pathway to licensure. There is also an overview of the different permits that have been issued and the number of active licenses by county to help identify shortage areas. Staff has also included a monthly breakdown of applications received, approved, canceled, withdrawn, and denied, along with the number of licenses issued. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Are there questions? Thank you. Um, GA, GCS. Okay. Agenda item. 15C is the General Anesthesia and Conscious Sedation Permit Evaluation Statistics. It provides an overview of the evaluations in 2018 and early 2019. Board staff is currently recruiting on-site inspection evaluators for the General Anesthesia, Conscious Sedation, and Medical General Anesthesia programs and are conducting evaluator calibration training courses in May of this year. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about this agenda item. Okay. 
Yeah, I'd like to thank staff for passing out the graphical summary that I usually prepare every year. Uh, this is nice because you can see the trends. Um, general anesthesia evaluations are down a little bit projected for this year, but still well above the minimum of 165 per year we need to make, maintain currency. Uh, conscious sedation evaluations are flat. Uh, one thing that's really nice to see is a slight uptick on physician general anesthesia permit holders evaluations, which we have eight scheduled. That traditionally was an area that had kind of been inactive, and I made the suggestion that since we were sort of caught up on the uh, dental uh, permit holders, that maybe we give renewed attention to the physician permit holders as well, and it's good to see that, that that's happening. Those are very difficult evaluations to schedule because those uh, permit holders move around a lot and also they have a requirement for uh, MD, DDS to evaluate them and we don't have too many of those evaluators. Um, of a little bit of concern is the, uh, and I, again I don't have this here, and oh yeah here it is, the second uh, table shows the number of evaluators and we can see our general anesthesia evaluators are in a, a continually declining number due to retirements and people just sort of aging out and not being replaced. So we're down by 50 evaluators statewide uh, as of this year. Uh, encouraging is that conscientization evaluators are at least flat and not declining. So our, our numbers there show, I, hopefully, uh, the fruits of efforts to do further recruitment of that. And again, uh, just to mention that we do have some calibration workshops for evaluators coming up in May. There's one north, one south. We're going to feature both uh, combined GACS evaluation calibration and individual courses. Some people only want to know the specific information. They need to be one type of evaluator or the other. Uh, we haven't done these for a while. There has been a calibration video available online. Uh, Again, I hopefully our evaluators all look at that before they go out. But we've had a, had some requests from uh, particularly younger clinicians entering the field that are asked to do evaluations. They've reached the requirement of three years of having a permit, and they want to do it, but they're a little unsure as to how to go about conducting the evaluation. So we thought Jessica was nice enough to help me set up <clears throat> some calibration workshops, and we'll in be inviting some other clinicians too, as we usually kind of team up on these to do these. So I think those dates will be coming out, and you can mark your calendar. If you want them, let me know, and I'll make sure you have them. So thank you. Okay, what now? So at this time, how do we recruit um, new evaluators? And then how does one find basic um, criteria on what they need to have before being an evaluator? I might defer to Dr. Witcher on that question. There is a standing posting on the website. Uh, this has promoted a lot of the meetings, a lot of the association meetings every year. Uh, you know, people can always check with Jessica, who's extremely available, really easy to reach by email. And she kind of runs the program and keeps track of things. But, you know, the basic requirements are just that you can't have had any disciplinary actions. You have to have had a permit for three years, and you have to be licensed and in good standing so just to follow up Jessica is preparing a letter that's going to be uh, sent out to all of our current permit holders that meet the criteria for at least the minimum number of years then we can cross check to make sure that they don't have discipline but um, they'll be receiving letters to notify them of the upcoming course um, and to make reservations and then they also will receive continuing education credit to be able to attend Are they compensated? By continuing education? <laughs> <laughs> Just the, the evaluators do receive, receive mileage in per diem. It's kind of nominal. It doesn't replace what they lose for taking a pretty much a full day out of their practice. But th at least they get something. Thank you. It's like 250 bucks. OK. Great. And uh, how much is the cost for the permits for the licensee? Do you know? Do you know? They, they range. I don't have the exact figures right in front of me, but I believe it's between, is it, I think it's between five and six hundred dollars, and then the reevaluation fee is twenty five hundred. 
Yeah, the, the reevaluation only occurs every five years uh, for a general anesthesia permit holder and every six for a conscious sedation uh, permit holder. This does not apply to the oral conscious sedation permit where no evaluation is required, but there is a list of required equipment and drugs and facilities that are very similar for the oral conscious sedation. It's just we don't go out and actually look at it. Diversion program report. Good morning. Carlos Alvarez, Enforcement Chief, and I'm here to present the diversion uh, statistics. And these uh, statistics are from October 2018 through December 31st of 2018. And it's going to be kind of fast because um, there hasn't been any change from uh, September of 2018 all the way through December 31st. And so currently right now we have uh, active participants. We have 14, and that has not changed since September. And so therefore, the board is currently recruiting for a public member position on the northern deck, uh, two dental positions on the southern deck, and one physician psychologist position on the southern deck and a dental auxiliary position on both northern, uh, northern and southern deck. And so the next uh, diversion meeting is scheduled for April 10th of 2019 in Northern California. So that's my report. A uh, question? Any? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Through the chair. Uh, Carlos, for our newer members, the uh, the participants in this program, is, is there a standard length that, that, that they're signed up for? And could you could you talk about that a little bit? Five years uh, is 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 a number that comes to mind. How does that work? I believe it's, it goes on the case by case basis on the evaluation and on the participant. So I'm not too sure if there's an exact number that they do. They shoot for five years, depending on how why the participants are in the program. Oftentimes, if it's probationary and they have early termination of probation, then they drop out of the program. Just to, just to, so that our newer members understand the, a little bit more about that program. Right. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, discussion and possible action initiate rule making to amend California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Sections 10, 16, and 17, related to continuing education requirements. Sarah, I'd like to just start this off by saying that um, this item was agendized in this, the uh, Substance Use Awareness Committee and had a robust discussion uh, at the last meeting. Um, We've brought language before you today that we hope we can initiate, but if there's continued or if there's robust discussion among the board at this time and a lot of changes, we may have to bring it back to the May meeting. But that's just a the preface of let's get started and see how everybody feels and see if we can crank something out this time, if not this time, certainly by the May meeting. Good morning, Sarah Wallace, Assistant Executive Officer. So, as Karen mentioned, uh, we currently have continuing education requirements in our laws, um, both requiring mandatory continuing education courses um, specific to Infection Control and Dental Practice Act and the completion of American Red Cross or American Heart Association basic life support courses. Um, in 2018, Governor Brown signed into law Senate Bill 1109, which was discussed at the last board meeting, which added the inclusion of the risks of addi addiction associated with the use of Schedule II, II drugs in the specific required areas of mandatory continuing education. Currently, the board requires dentists to complete 58 units of continuing education every two years and dental assistants, uh, 25 units of continuing education to every two years. And so staff made an attempt to, to draft some language today to bring before the board. Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. 
Um, in the packets, you'll see Section 1016 is relating to continuing education courses and providers. These are the requirements that the board approved course providers must meet. And we had added in subdivision B1 that a mandatory course also needed to include a board approved course on the responsibilities and requirements of prescribing Schedule 2 opioids. Um, through some other discussions with stakeholders, board staff recommended um, adding some additional provisions to the continuing education re requirements. So that's why you see a few more amendments in here, just because we had the opportunity to open up the CE requirements. So you'll also see that <clears throat> the Course for Dental Practice Act would also include professional ethics on page one. Turning to page three. Towards the bottom of the page, courses in the following areas are considered to be primarily of benefit to the licensee and shall be limited to a maximum of 20% of the total course units required. And we added courses in organization and management of the dental practice, including business planning and operations, to be more specific. Sarah, on that page three at the top of the page, is that an additional? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, we also included sexual harassment prevention training. This is a result of several phone calls we've been receiving lately uh, regarding new laws uh, for small business small businesses and so wanting to make sure that we are in compliance with that and that we're clear with our course providers that they can teach the sexual harassment prevention training as part of their curriculum. <clears throat> Moving on to page 8, begins 1017. This is where you find the outline of continuing education units required for renewal of a license or a permit. And you'll find on page 9 that we specify that the mandatory requirements would also include the addition of two units of continuing education on pain management the identification of addiction or in the practices of prescribing or dispensing opioids. I would like to point out that the intention of this mandatory CE was only to be directed towards dentist licensees, not the registered dental assistants, RDAEFs, OA, or DSAs. And so the language will need to be tweaked. And Spencer and I have a couple of alternative options. So subdivision four at the beginning of page nine could be prefaced with only dentists shall be required to complete two units of continuing education on pain management, the identification of addiction, or in the practices of prescribing or dispensing opioids. Or an alternative would be to add a second sentence to subdivision four that would provide an exemption for RDAs, RDAEFs, OAs, and DSAs to have to fulfill this requirement. Moving on to page 10. Uh, Sarah, I have a question on page nine mm -hmm. under uh, mm -hmm. C, C2. Since hygiene is a board of its own now, why are we requiring continuing education units for dental hygienists when they have their own board? We, we have been asked, we've been in constant communication with dental hygiene committee and now dental hygiene board to ensure that we're not repealing portions of our regulations that they're still relying upon. And uh, it's my understanding right now, and working with Anthony Lum, that they've requested we not amend our regulations to remove any of the requirements for hygiene. I think they still depend on our current continuing education requirements. And therefore, until they give us the go-ahead and we know that their regulations are in effect, we're not going to, to touch anything there. I also have a question on the, that same page, number nine, on four where you have the description here. On the Senate bill, it requires to include the risks of, a, of addiction associated with the Schedule II drugs. That is not included in this language. It, it, it says pain management, identification, identification of addiction, or in the practice of prescribing, dispensing opioids, but it doesn't say what the bill is requiring, the risks of addiction. Yes. Is that going to be somewhere? Well, we've, this is, we're bringing proposed language yeah. to the board to discuss today. And so at this point, uh, we're asking for additional feedback. If you are comfortable with the language as is, 
the intention of the language the way it's currently written is to be broad enough to allow the board approved registered providers um, <clears throat> their their availability to to mock or I'm sorry to modify their courses to meet the requirements that they need to meet. Does, does that cover that? It's just yesterday we had to change language on something different to and the board and the board yeah. can choose to to modify language. So that's that's part of the discussion here today. Sir, is it appropriate um, at the oh sorry. Sir, is it appropriate at this level of the discussion to um, consider a pediatric component on this um, and the reasoning behind it was that we've had a few references to the highest increasing numbers of, of addiction is with kids from nine through adolescence. Is, is this the appropriate way to part to do it or do we if, do it downstream? Well if the board wanted to include that in the regulations this would be an appropriate time. We could have the discussion, board staff could bring back the feedback and we could recraft language to bring back at the main meeting. Thank you. So page 10 added um, a requirement, well not a requirement, an option for licensees to receive continuing education credit who provide direct patient care as an unpaid volunteer at a free public health care event or nonprofit community health clinic um, for up to three units of their total continuing education requirements. So I, I have a question and maybe a comment about that one. First of all, I certainly don't disagree with providing free health uh, care uh, events and dentists participating in them. Uh, however, uh, Providing three continuing education units for volunteering at a healthcare event without increasing the number of units required from 50 to 53, we are basically diluting the number of hours required for relicensure in those areas of dentistry that might need some continuing education. Uh, providing free health care at a clinic is nothing new. That's something that dentists do on a daily basis. Uh, how, no, so now comes my question. How long has 50 units been required? And uh, if we are going to provide a reduction in those units of education for volunteering at a healthcare clinic, should we consider raising the number of units required? Again, how long has it been 50? Look at the advances in dentistry at this point in time. Look at the amount of, of uh, technology that is invading the practice of dentistry. And we still have an, an increased amount of knowledge that we need to know and certainly an increased uh, number of skills that we need to have at our disposal, but we have not increased the number of hours required to obtain that. I think that my pushback on that is that everybody's not going to do that. Everybody's not going to do what? It's not going to provide free services. I understand that, but and I would I would hope anyway that they didn't provide the free services so they got the three hours of credit. But yet at the same time, those that do are going to have to are required to do three hours less. I don't. I don't see that as being a big enough universe to um, consider increasing the hours. The thing that I have heard most is um, concerns about some significant increase in the number of hours. Yes. If I could comment. We have a pretty specific agenda item here with some specific requests for change. If we get into a discussion of increasing the number of hours, I think we'd really need to bring that back for further discussion at another, as another item. I mean, it, that's a much bigger topic than what we're talking about here. Okay. <clears throat> and then finally on page 12, board staff has included an amendment relating to a piece of legislation that passed several years ago 
reducing the number of required continuing education for retired dentists um, and to specify the requirements and regs to be in compliance with that statute which specifies continuing education for retired dentists and uncompensated practice shall include mandatory courses and courses directly related to the delivery of dental services to patients and shall be no less than 30 units. So at this point, I wanted to explain a little bit more as to why uh, we crafted the language the way we did for the opioid risks of opioid addiction for mandatory CE. So the board currently requires mandatory courses for two-hour infection control and a two-hour Dental Practice Act course and then basic life support. The board issues continuing education provider permits to uh, providers that apply to the board. They apply on a form that essentially they're registering with the board. They do not necessarily need to provide any of their course content or notify us of the courses that they intend to produce. Um, during their two-year biennial renewal, they do provide an, a, a report at that time where they outline all of the courses and their participants and how many certificates were issued so that we have an audit process. This is a little bit different than the requirements for the mandatory course providers for the two-hour infection control and the Dental Practice Act. If a, man, if a course provider wants to offer a course on the two-hour infection control or on the DPA, they have to apply to the board, notify the board that they intend to offer a mandatory course, provide a course content outline, which is then reviewed by board staff and approved. If they are approved, they, be, they receive a, a notification and they, uh, on the license search lookup, they receive a modifier. So it's either an IC or a DPA that is printed on their certificates so that they're notified that they are authorized to provide a mandatory course. The process behind approving that course content can be cumbersome, um, but we're very dependent upon the fact that it's outlined in the Dental Practice Act, which staff has easily available, and to the infection control regulations that we have in 1005. The risks of opioid prediction uh, prescribing is a little bit more broad. I don't know that board staff is necessarily equipped to identify what would be appropriate course content and what would not. And so board staff is therefore proposing that, yes, it be considered a mandatory course, but to be offering the mandatory course, they don't have to become a mandatory course provider. Therefore, they wouldn't have to receive one of those modifiers that would be printed on their certificate. This would open it up to any board approved provider that issues current CE, or the board also accepts any SERP or PACE providers. So that would open up the options for the providers to be able to offer this course content and for the licensees to be able to receive the continuing education. There looks to be a bit of confusion, so speak. <laughs> Enlighten us. I would, uh, you know, we have been working uh, as part of the Substance Use uh, Disorder Committee, we've been working for a number of years trying to move this uh, agenda item, and I'm just thrilled that, that, that it is moving and that, that uh, it's come to this point where now we're talking about this language. Um, and the, the reason that I have been so passionate about this particular uh, agenda item is that um, there are a lot of problems in the world, but a lot of the, those problems don't raise to the level of a crisis. But the opioid issue has, has raised to, to the level of a crisis where um, people are dying, grandparents are raising grandchildren. Um, you know, uh, it's just, it, it's something that uh, uh, I think the dentistry needs to be at the table and we need to do our part. This is getting us uh, to, uh, to work a, as a, a profession, to recognize the crisis, and to get all of our participants, all of our colleagues, on a level playing field. We've had courses at our major CE events, and they're excellent. We have excellent subject matter experts, Dr. Parks, Dr. Bundy, that, that have put out great words. 
a great education in this arena. The problem is that, the, uh, and I've been in those classes, the, the numbers aren't big. So the small rooms are full, the people are being educated, and, but what, what I think we need to do is, be, and the reason that it's important to make it mandatory is that it will reach all of our colleagues. And so we'll be in the big room and, and we can get that education piece uh, to our colleagues so that everybody's on a level playing field. Uh, as Sarah indicated, we're trying to keep this approach broad uh, because uh, there are so many aspects to uh, the opioid crisis and, and trying to help our patients get the care that they need, that they deserve, their families deserve, uh, that, that there will be um, several topics that uh, people might be able to choose between one renewal period and another. So we're not trying to be real pres prescriptive, we're trying to keep it broad, but we're trying to understand and communicate that this, this crisis is something that we all need to understand and all need to work towards to, to make a difference for the health of our, for our citizens. So I would urge you to look at this language uh, if, if we need to, to, to weak it. I, I think the language is good. It works, it works for me. I hope it works for you. And it's gonna work, it's gonna move this process along. The important thing is that the dental board, our job is it, to recognize that if it does need to be a mandatory course, that, that, that we're the ones that can do that. That's our job and that's what we've done. Uh, we, will, we can work with CDA, we can work with many other entities that are able to put the course together and, uh, and we could link up with those folks and, uh, and they, they can get the subject matter experts working to, to put together a, a, a course that we can approve. Uh, so we don't have to reinvent that wheel, but uh, I'm just, uh, I'm hoping that you will agree with me that uh, our, our part has been to do the mandatory part. The, the words are in there, the language is there, and if you can uh, support it, um, I would ask you to do so. I want to agree with Dr. Stewart. I think that it is it's an appropriate and it is a crisis that we need to address rather than bury our heads in the sand and hope that it'll go away. Uh, and I'm all in favor of approving a mandatory uh, course yeah, for renewal of license in uh, substance abuse, risk of addiction, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I support it completely. Uh, in the course of being on Substance Use Awareness Committee, I looked around for what's available in the way of CE, and there's a broad range of courses. Uh, the language here is pretty general. Uh, you know, I, I could, we could do a lot of revisions and make a lot of changes and add a lot of verbiage, but the fact is they need to fill two hours. There's a lot of ways to do it. A lot of these topics overlap. Uh, the language here is pretty concise. I think it does the job. And uh, I like the idea of being able to recognize a variety of course providers and not having to have necessarily a board approved course to have the CE in that area required, but not to have it go through a separate approval process that's really going to bog things down. Mm -hmm. So uh, although I could have had a lot to say about it, I like it the way it is. <laughs> Point of information, Sarah. In the Item two, even though we're not changing it, this is just as a question. The California Dental Practice Act and its regulations. I'm on page eight. Um, it's on <coughs> ten seventeen two, and this is again just more of a question. In the content of those courses, does it talk about the new cures? Not the new cures, but the <coughs> cures and the prescription writing. Is that part of the content that has to be? <coughs> Not necessarily because that's actually not part of the Dental Practice Act. Oh. Hmm. <coughs> okay, thanks. Anyone else? Uh, um, just as a point of clarification, and I know we discussed a lot about the regulatory process yesterday, but if the board decided to initiate this rulemaking today and board staff put together the 
initial rulemaking documents and it was approved by the department. It would go through a 45-day public comment period. And if the board received adverse comments in response to the proposal, we would have to bring it back to the board so there could be another opportunity to amend the language in the future. At this point, though, are, are we recommending that those changes be included that on page <coughs> 9 we say only dentists will be required to take two units of continuing education? Yes. Bo board staff recommends one of two <coughs> options, either adding only dentists shall be required to complete and then the two units or adding a sentence after that would say, Something along the lines of RDAs, RDAEFs, OAs, DSAs are exempt from this requirement. And I think that adds clarification to the, to the wording, so I, I'm in support of that. Is the easiest one on, essentially only dentists rather than adding an exception? Okay. Thank you. How about um, including the comments that Dr. Laren made? include the risk of addiction in that list essentially under that same item number four so it would say only dentists shall be required to take two units of continuing education on pain management the identification of addiction risks of addiction or in the practices of prescribing or dispensing <coughs> I would you say that, that well. one more time the language would be and of course this would all be underlined. <clears throat> Only dentists shall be required to take two units of continuing education on pain management, the identification of addiction, risks of addiction, or in the practices of prescribing or dispensing opioids. So as Dr. Stewart said, this would um, essentially, there are a number of categories here that people could take from year to year without having a one repetitive course requirement. I'm good with that. The last one again. The risk of addiction, there was a third element. It's risk of addiction. Or in the practices oh, the of. Practice. So that's already in there. Yeah. Then if, if the board wishes to approve the language, board staff is asking for the following motion. To approve the proposed regulatory language relative to continuing education requirements for licensees and direct staff to take all steps necessary to initiate the formal rulemaking process, including noticing the proposed language for 45-day public comment, setting the proposed language for a public hearing, and delegating authority to the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes to the rulemaking package. If after the close of the 45-day public comment period and public regulatory hearing, no adverse comments are received, delegate authority to the executive officer to make any technical or non-substantive changes to the proposed regulations before completing the rulemaking process and adopt the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations Title 16, Section 1016, and 1017, as noticed in the proposed text. Okay. I'd like to move the language. Move Burton. Second. Witcher. Uh, move the language as amended. amended. Yep. Good. And second. Witcher. Um, any more board member comment, public comment? Gail Matthew, CDA. Um, at first, I'd like to thank you all very much. There's some good things in here, important things in here, things that little technical cleanups uh, that uh, CDA has been hoping would occur. So thank you. This is exciting. Um, as you know, we've been providing a course. Dr. Uh, um, Stewart referenced it. And we'll continue to develop additional education in these areas. So we're excited to move that forward. Um, I do have one technical ask. And Sarah, you're right here. Um, given the discussion about having it be two units that are required but not necessarily a specific curriculum uh, as the CDPA and the infection control are, whether this would, and I am looking on page one, uh, B1, whether that would read mandatory courses required by the board for license renewal to include 
board-approved course in infection control, board-approved course in California Dental Practice Act, completion of certification in basic life support, and a course on the responsibilities and requirements and whether the, where, whether the board approved would need to be pulled out of that given the discussion that it's not a specific course. It's a technical question uh, on the language. And again, thank you very much. I'm going to I'm going to defer to Spencer, but I think either way would be okay because there's later later on in the regulations that's where it specifies that the IC or the DPA course has to provide the course content. So the mandatory would still be a board approved course because it's still a board approved course provider. I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Seeing no other questions, I'm going to call for the vote. Okay. Oh, any more public comment? Okay, Burton. Yes. Burton, yes. Chan, yes. Chappelle Ingram. Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Lai. Yes. Lai, yes. Laren. Yes. Laren, yes. Lay. Lay, yes. Mackenzie, absent. Well, absent. Mm -hmm. And Medina, absent. Morrow. Yes. Morrow, yes. Alagi. Yes. Alagi, yes. Pacheco. Yes. Pacheco, yes. Stewart. Yes. Stewart, yes. Witcher. Yes. Witcher, yes. You. Yes. You, yes. Madam Chairperson, yeah. we are unanimous in this. Awesome. <coughs> Thank you so much. This is always such a laborious process, a labor of love process. So thank you very much. Item 17A, <coughs> is a tentative legislative calendar. <coughs> um, the, the most important thing there, uh, being in February, is um, that the 22nd is the last day for bills to be introduced. Any questions? Item 17B is discussion of legislation. So as President Burton pointed out, the last day to introduce bills isn't for another two weeks. And so at this point, staff have identified only four bills that have been introduced this session um, that we are beginning to track. And every morning, our legislative analyst uh, check the system to see if there's any additional bills that have been updated. So at this point, we have the following four bills that we're going to be presenting today. AB 149, AB 193, SB 53, and SB 154. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and present each of these. Uh, I'd like to preface it with, because it's so early in the legislative session at this point, staff is recommending that we take a watch position on, on, on these bills. Um, these bills tend to morph very quickly after the introduction de deadline closes. <coughs> so beginning with AB 149, as our executive officer reported earlier, this was introduced to address an issue that was created by Assembly Bill 1753 relating to the prescription requirements for the printers for the opioid <coughs> prescribing. This bill would delay the requirement for those prescription forms to include the uniquely serialized number until a date determined by Department of Justice that's no later than January 1st of 2020. The serialized number to be utilized as a bar, it would require the serialized number to be utilized as a barcode that can be scanned by the dispensers and would additionally make any prescription written on an otherwise valid prescription form prior to January 1st of 2019 that does not include that, that uniquely serialized number or any prescription written on a form approved by the Department of Justice as of January 1st, 2019, a valid prescription that may be filled, compounded, or dispensed until January 1st of 2021. So this bill was intended to leave the door open to patients being unable to fill essential prescriptions and address that issue that had been created. It would allow the patients to gain access to needed medication at this point. 
The impact on the board cannot be determined at this time. It does not make any direct amendments to the Dental Practice Act, but it would impact our licensees. And so staff recommends the board take a watch position at this point. Are there any questions, comments? I will move. We can do it with a mask. Okay. So okay. that was my question. Do we divide it or no. we can bundle it? We'll bundle it. Okay. okay. So the next bill is Assembly Bill 193. This bill would require the Department of Consumer Affairs beginning January 1st of 2021 to conduct a comprehensive review of all occupational licensing requirements and identify unnecessary licensing requirements that cannot be adequately justified. The department would be required to report to the legislature beginning January 1st of 2023 and every two years thereafter with a final report due to the legislature by January 1st of 2033. So at this point, the impact on the board is not identifiable at this time and board staff recommends the board take a watch position. Any questions? The next bill is SB 53. This is relating to the Bagley Keen Open Meetings Act. The current law requires that all meetings of a state body be open and public and that all persons be permitted to attend and participate in a meeting of a state body subject to certain conditions and exceptions. This bill specifies the, the definition of a state body includes an advisory board, advisory commission, advisory committee, advisory subcommittee, or <clears throat> similar multi-member advisory body of a state body that consists of three or more individuals as prescribed. Um, at this point, if a member serves a body in his or her official capacity as a representative of that state body that is supported by state funds, then they would be considered to be a member of a state body. So this is an urgency bill and would declare that it would take effect immediately. At this point, it's unclear what the impact would be to the Dental Board of California, as we typically only have subcommittees of two members or less. And at this point, we recommend taking a watch position. Um, my observation on this is that while it may not affect the board, I question whether it would would impact our deck, and so we have to kind of keep an eye on it for that reason. Yes. Are there any questions on this one? Yeah, just a question of clarity: Is a subcommittee, a two-member subcommittee of the board, considered uh, an advisory committee? No. Any other questions? The last bill, SB 154, board staff identified and brought forward to the board meeting. It does not impact the board or the Dental Practice Act, but this was similar to a bill that was introduced last session and was supported by the board but had been vetoed by the governor. So this bill authorizes the provider of services for a treatment of dental caries to provide and receive reimbursement for the application of silver diamine fluoride when used as a caries arresting agent. Um, for specified populations of Medi-Cal beneficiaries if specified conditions are met. Um, this bill would not have a fiscal impact on the dental board because it's not part of the dental board's program, but the board had previously taken a support position on SB 1148, which was an identical bill. Sorry. <coughs> From, sorry. <coughs> oh, we're a pair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, same, same, same bill as SB 1148 from last year. And so at this point, staff recommends taking a watch position. Now, if I recall the previous bill, um, one of the things that I had suggested with this was um, to look at what we do, what what we were required to do, but there were some members who felt that we needed to 
support this, although it's sort of kind of outside of the purview of what our mandate is. Are there any questions? Yeah, I, although I understand why the staff is recommending um, to watch, you know, I would really hope that we will support it. And the reason for that is, first of all, we supported last year. This bill is exactly the same. So why are we not supporting it this time? Number two, um, the Department of Health Services, uh, as part of the Dental Transformation Initiative, um, does have a pilot program in like 11 counties in the state uh, where they give you know, grant money to many of the practices to, um, to provide silver diamine you know, fluoride to a lot of these children. Um, silver diamine fluoride has been very effective, has been proven to be very effective to keep a lot of children out of the hospital um, dentistry. Um, and even also in elderly patients, um, you know, who are not ambulatory. So we can go to the nursing homes and apply these, you know, this um, silver diamine fluoride, you know, to a lot of these patients. Um, so, I mean, you know, of course, from coming from a public health perspective, I use it, I teach my students to use it, dental schools are teaching it, um, you know, and, and um, if you asked me seven, eight years ago about it, I probably would have said no, uh, but now, 2019, I am a strong believer, you know, of, of the uh, application and the effectiveness, you know, of silver diamine fluoride, and I know that we supported it, Governor Brown, you know, um, vetoed it. Um, so, I mean, the law passed at that time. It was vetoed by the governor. Um, you know, with the new governor and his health care, you know, initiative, I'm, of course, very hopeful that it will go forward. Um, so, you know, I just want to, to state my, you know, my, my opinion about it. Um, um, but I, I also understand, you know, why, you know, the board staff is recommending a watch position. Um, you know, um, I mean, my vote, of course, would be to support it, but... And my response to that would be the response that I always give this time of year. This bill has not even had its first hearing. And despite the fact that it, it may at this moment be the same thing as it was in the past, there's nothing to say that, that something may come along that we will object to later on. I think that there's time in the process um, to take a position. And I would strongly urge that we not do that at this point. Yeah, no, and so I, I just, I just, I understand the process and the legislative you know, timing and all that, but I just want to have it on the record that I support it and I urge that the board in future will support it. <laughs> Any questions, any other comments? Okay, so we have heard a discussion on the four bills and I am going to move that um, at this time we watch the four bills. AB 149, AB 193, SB 53 and SB 154. Second. Move Burton second. Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Any comment? Any public comment? Call for the vote. Okay, this is agenda item number uh, 17B. Right. Burton? Yes. Burton, yes. Chan? Yes. Chappelle Ingram? Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Lai? Yes. Lai, yes. Laren? Yes. Laren, yes. Lay? Yes. Lay, yes. McKenzie, absent. Medina, absent. Morrow? Yes. Morrow, yes. Alagi? Yes. Alagi, yes. Pacheco? Yes. Pacheco, yes. Stewart? Yes. Stewart, yes. Witcher? Yes. Witcher, yes. You? Yes. You, yes. Motion passes unanimously, Madam Chair. Thanks again. The next item is um, just 17C, Prospective Legislative Proposal. 
This is a standing agenda item where stakeholders are encouraged to submit proposals in writing to the board before or during the meeting for possible consideration by the board at a future meeting. Does anyone have anything to bring forward? Thank you. 18. Madam Chairman. Uh, so LCP committee met in closed session yesterday to consider 11 candidates for issuance of a new license to replace canceled ones. Thoughtful discussion was afforded to each of the applicants. All members of our committee voiced their opinions and voted to concur with the following results. Dr. S.G.J. granted with the passage of California Dental Law and Ethics exam. RDAs. 10 of them, initials J A C E H K J K M F M T E R E S T Z, granted with the completion of the RDA General Law and Ethics written exam. RDAs with the initials M C and C Z and C Z will be granted without taking the general law and ethics written exam. Today my committee and I request that you accept our report and this concludes LCP's committee report. Okay. The motion is to accept the LCP report. Is there a motion? And recommendations. Is there a motion? Moved. Stewart, second, Lauren, Baron. Any questions? Okay, call for the vote. Okay, Burton. Yes. Burton, yes. Chan, yes. Chappelle Ingram. Yes. Chappelle Ingram, yes. Lai. Yes. Lai, yes. Laren. Yes. Laren, yes. Lay. Yes. Lay, yes. Mackenzie, absent. Medina, absent. Moro. Yes. Moro, yes. Alagi. Yes. Alagi, yes. Pacheco. Yes. Pacheco, yes. Stewart. Yes. Stewart, yes. Witcher. Yes. Witcher, yes. You. Yes. You, yes. Motion passes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, number 19, public comment on items not on the agenda. Seeing none. Board member comments on items not on the agenda. Dr. Stewart. Is this the time to discuss possible future agenda items? Mm -hmm. Then I, I would like to suggest that we include a conversation uh, relative to maybe a, a, an overview or a review of the Dental Practice Act in terms of uh, the ethics, the ethical uh, part of, of, of that educational piece. I have concerns that um, I, I think that we might be able to reinforce our uh, ethical education uh, among our, our uh, colleagues uh, over the, uh, you, you know, rather than just a, a, during initial licensure, but even throughout the career by, by, by supporting it, making it stronger, and, uh, and uh, in, in w within that uh, Dental Practice Act. So uh, I would like to see us have a conversation relative to that uh, in light of the fact that so many of our disciplinary cases have an ethical component. It seems reasonable that we make sure that we're doing the job to have a, a, a strong uh, ethics education throughout our careers. So I'd like to see that as agendized as a fu future item for discussion. I make a comment on that? Yeah. Um, Turn your mic closer, please. Okay. And I may need uh, some staff help on this, but I believe that um, Hawaii now has part of their mandatory continuing ed ethics separate from just their practice act. You can look into that. This is, is somewhat relevant, and I think staff may be aware of this, that uh, SB 1109 not only required mandatory CE related to opioid prescribing, but there's also a requirement 
for conformed consent when prescribing to minors. And I know that there's been a little bit circulating from the associations with some sample forms, but that didn't really come up in our, in our discussion of 1109. It's pretty far down there. It's actually a change to the health and safety code. So I just want to remind everybody that that's still in there. Yes. Uh, I just want to um, further continuation on the uh, teaching permit and to let's bring that up. I don't want to lose hold on it because last meeting we had a really good discussion about it. So I want to know where we are and how we can move it forward. Anyone else? I also have a note to remind a board member to bring up whether or not you want a review of the regional examinations to determine whether you want to outline competencies. Yes, I I'll put it on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> then. I'm, yeah. I'm seeing a lot yeah, of this. Like that remember that, that conversation <laughs> we had <laughs> earlier? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Anything else? Well, with that, I believe we are adjourned. <laughs>